Last but not least, uh, our next speaker is uh, Kacper Lukowski. Uh, he's a software developer and uh, he will tell us that uh, we shouldn't use a lot where little will do. It's a story about of programming tricks you wished you have invented. So please welcome Kacper. Uh, thanks a lot. Yeah, as, uh, as said, I'm a developer advocate at Quadrant. Well, if you are interested in vector databases, then Quadrant is something that I strongly encourage you to have a look at. But today I'm not going to be talking about Quadrant at all, uh, even though this is quite a fancy tool. Uh, but I would like to talk a bit about tricks, and uh, hopefully you have also some stories to share afterwards. Uh, but basically, uh, we should start with some kind of definition. What I mean by trick? Well. One definition that I really like is that a trick is something that you feel really proud of when you write it during the code review, but really ashamed for when you need to describe it like three months later to another developer, how it works and what it's supposed to be doing. Uh, but basically there are, I'm not going to be talking about some hidden, uh, hidden gems, some hidden features of any uh, programming language or some uh, paradigms that you not, not, do not know, but I will try to convince you that there are some things that you should, uh, should carry about, and they are not that technical as uh, you might be expecting. Well, how did it start? Uh, when I was uh, studying uh, during the first semester on my uh, computer science studies, I found out that there is a better way, uh, memory saving way of swapping to variables. And this is a fairly easy trick that, that everybody has to implement during the first uh, year or, or, or mm, well, actually any, any uh, programming classes. Uh, you can use exclusive OR just to swap two variables in place without uh, making a, a, new, uh, a new temporal variable to, uh, to save one of those values uh, to, to, to perform that operation. And this is quite cool, but at these times, and if you program in Python, you actually do not care. You can also do it in one line. So uh, this is not that good optimization. However, back in the days, that was quite cool to be, to be uh, recognized that even some simple cases might be optimized uh, and save memory. And uh, I started to think uh, if there are any other tricks, uh, if there were any other tricks during my career that I found really useful. And it happened several times, and I would like to share some of those stories with you. Um, when I joined my first company uh, as a PHP developer, I was actually put in a project that required me to uh, write a lot of SQL queries. And that wasn't only like a simple select statement, taking the, the data from, from a few tables, uh, but there were some processes that were written using some uh, temporary tables in MySQL uh, because back in the days, MySQL wasn't supporting the uh, sub-queries that, uh, that well. So uh, there were some intermediate steps uh, uh, that were creating some, uh, some temporary tables, putting the data, and trying to pivot the data somehow. And that was, uh, that was fairly uh, complex. Uh, there were a lot of sub-nested sub statements, uh, attempts to write C extensions to the database just in order to make it performant. Uh, long story short, we were about to implement uh, uh, some uh, models, some uh, machine learning models, simple ones like, like naive bias classifier, directly on the database level to perform, uh, perform some optimization in e-commerce world. That was a failure, I have to admit, but uh, at this point, that was like the, the best solution that came up to our minds because all the rest of the system was strongly based on PHP. And if, if you have ever implemented anything in PHP uh, that was never really optimized for anything, I heard that it has changed a bit in the, in the recent version, but um, I, was I success successfully uh, moved to Python and some other uh, technologies, so I do not care a lot. Uh, uh, but since then, uh, I recognize that, that, well, I thought that SQL is like a language that is not uh, being developed anymore. We have, some, uh, we have a, a language that is quite easy to, to uh, retrieve some data, but I found out, thanks to my colleague, uh, the laziest man that I have ever met, 
uh, that there are also some things that, that were added to the language just to simplify those uh, quite common problems. And one of those examples is, uh, is a common table expression or common tables expressions, which are, in a nutshell, they allow you to put some kind of aliases to the, to the select statements uh, and then use those aliases in the later processing. So instead of writing a nested query, you can just uh, put some names. Uh, okay, I, you can put some names and use those names later on in the, in the uh, later steps of, of that query. And if you remember those nested queries using some sub-statements sub uh, just to select some, some, uh, some values out of their tables, this is fairly easy, and this is supported by all the modern uh, RDB, RDBMSs. Uh, basically, um, basically uh, I, I don't know about the performance of that, but, but actually that simplifies a lot and makes the, co uh, makes the code uh, much more readable than it was with those uh, traditional statements. And uh, I, I recognize that feature uh, quite late, uh, thanks to the colleague that I mentioned before. Uh, well, previously I had a, a different, uh, different approach to any problem. When I was given a task, I just started working on it right away. But he was lazy enough to start trying to find a better solution, maybe watch some YouTube videos, uh, just to see whether there are some other options that he didn't know at, at this point. And thanks for that, he was really up to date with the, uh, with the recent, uh, uh, recently introduced features of, of not only SQL, but also some other technologies that we've been using. Uh, my approach was different, I was just using whatever I knew, because, well, at the end of the day, uh, we need to solve the problems, and the, the way that we solve them is not that important for the customers or the clients that we work for. So I didn't care, but, but I, my approach changed since then. And another thing that I also find quite useful in the modern SQL uh, is, uh, are the window functions. So if you struggle with calculating some statistics, but not in general, but let's say in some subgroups of your data, you can easily use those, uh, at, for example, rank function over some partitions. So that will calculate the position of each row, but not in the whole set, but uh, by considering the value of the depth name and ordering those, uh, those rows within those subgroups by a specific column. This is fairly easy, and I was quite surprised because uh, in my previous company I was interviewing a lot of data analysts and data scientists, and just some people knew uh, that there are some, uh, some extensions to this, uh, to this standard SQL like common table expressions and window functions. So that makes you like a distinguished engineer if you know those. Uh, but there are also some uh, things that people consider programming tricks that help, help them actually to solve the given problem, but they are made, uh, on, uh, they are made on some wrong assumptions. Uh, and uh, wrong assumptions uh, just, uh, just come from, the, from some, um, from the bad understanding of the, of the uh, given task. If we assume that something is not going to occur, uh, and this is truly going to occur, but, but probably will hit, a, hit us in, uh, in the face a few, uh, few months or even few years after, after implementing that. And there are a lot of stories when laziness uh, caused some troubles. Um, well, this is quite a common example in academia using some sentinel values, and sentinel value is a value that has some special meaning. Well, now is one of the examples uh, missing uh, of encoding the, the fact of missing uh, value. But there are also some cases when we uh, put some special meaning to some characters, uh, well, like, like end of the line. Uh, and here we can also assume that the, the, uh, some specific character is a, is a line ending, but on, the, on a different uh, operating system, uh, it won't be, uh, won't be true at all. Uh, and this is quite common. And if we are sure that a specific value won't occur on our data, then it might be fine. But there are also some cases like uh, stat graphics uh, in which they used a specific integer to determine uh, a missing value. And this is truly going to, um, this is fine uh, if you, well, know it, test it, but if your users do not know about that, uh, then definitely uh, th that may impact their, uh, their uh, processes and really destroy them. Um, 
There was also a, a, a talk about, about this specific topic, but, but the assumption that everybody has the first and last name is quite, uh, quite common. Uh, and this is also, uh, this, this is also uh, not true in most of the cases. Um, so if you design any system and just assume that, that, that some local, uh, uh, local rules will apply to everybody in the whole world, uh, this is typically, uh, typically not true. And there are many, many different cases described on, on the website that I linked here. Uh, but, but people typically do not have like a first and last name. And uh, if you design your system in a way that will be accepting only those two attributes, then you, you may simply fail. Uh, well, in the, in the worst case, if you design like e-commerce system, uh, somebody won't be able to buy anything from your, from your uh, store. So you are losing some money, but, but there are also some other cases when you will just excluding part of the world just because you didn't understand it properly. And that was uh, quite an interesting, uh, interesting issue back in the days. I'm not sure if you remember it, but um, in ActionScript version three, they assumed that string null will be evaluated to like missing value, null but, but a missing value. And that worked for a couple of years, I think. But then in one of the company, there was a guy, I don't know the, his first name, but let's assume that was John Null. And his name was evaluated to an empty value, and that caused a lot of troubles to the uh, to the to the company. I, I'm not sure if anybody is using ActionScript uh, currently, but that was uh, like a wrong assumption that led to a serious issue. But okay, I, I was supposed to talk about tricks, and th those were tricks that were rather some. Um, bad ideas uh, implemented by somebody who wanted to solve one problem and created a bunch of different ones. But there are also some uh, tools that you use on your daily basis, like uh, regular expressions, which might be uh, quite interesting and quite, quite useful, uh, but they are also like mysterious creatures and, and only few of us uh, are able to understand given regular expression that wasn't written uh, by, our, uh, by ourselves. Um, well, also something that I stated here, uh, parsing HTML is not the best idea. Uh, uh, parsing HTML with regular expressions is not the best idea, but we typically do it when we web scrape and it's any services, this is, this is the way to go. Uh, well, what is the problem? Uh, let's say I would like to match a specific word, let's say Tarzan, but only if it's not enclosed with the quotation mark. The idea behind this is, is simple enough. Uh, I want to match the name uh, of a person, but not the movie title. And if it's enclosed with quotation marks, then I assume that this is a movie title. And this is a fairly, uh, fairly easy example, um, but... Uh, Probably there are a lot of cases when you would like to do something, something similar. Well, and what should be the approach? How should I uh, write the regular expression in order to be able to recognize those cases that I want, so without those enclo uh, enclosing quotation marks? Well, this is one of the possible solutions. So I can use uh, negative uh, look-ahead assertions and look-behind assertions. So, well, that's not the easiest regex that I have ever seen, right? Uh, we need to know those rules, and if we do not have like a good understanding of regular expressions, though, look ahead and look behind assertions are not that easy to follow. So definitely, if you find something like this in your source code, then you would struggle with understanding what is what it, it is supposed to uh, supposed to support, unless it's properly tested. And just by looking at the at the test scenarios, you can uh, you can find the uh, positive and negative examples. Um, there is also another way, so we could replace the, uh, replace the phrase, the one with, uh, enclosed with quotation marks with something different, and then uh, just, just uh, turn this problem into replaced and match. That would also work unless we replace it with something that will also occur in our data, so the same story like with this sentinel values. So uh, we have to be careful with that. However, there is also the best regex trick that I linked here that allows us to convert this, uh, this well, complex, uh, complex regular expression to, to a simple alternative. Of course, the output of it is a bit different. 
because previously we just uh, found this uh, proper example. But now we have like two results, but one of them is empty. How does it work? Basically, because I, uh, I didn't enclose uh, this, first, uh, this first part of that alternative uh, with, the, uh, with the brackets, it is being uh, found, but evaluates to an empty string, and that's it. We, we found it, but ignored it, and we can handle that case quite easily. And if we wanted to add some additional exceptions, like single, uh, single quotes, this is also fairly easy. So uh, this is quite interesting. Uh, but another thing that I really found interesting, in, at least in Python, is the debug mode of the, of the regular expressions. So you can also see like a state machine and how this is going to be, uh, to be uh, parsed by the engine behind it. So this is quite, uh, quite interesting if you struggle with, uh, with uh, making some regular expressions and try to debug them. But back in the days, uh, the dirty hacks were justified by, by optimization. We were caring uh, about the memory, about the CPU usage a lot because the hardware was really expensive. And uh, we agreed to use those hacks just because we wanted to have, uh, um, to reduce the memory overhead that was uh, generated by our application. And it still happens, but not, not that often. Um, so some of, the, some of those stories may be a little bit outdated, but I'm pretty sure that some of you have heard about this story, and that uh, was found in the leaked Quake 3 uh, source code. So this is a function that is intended to calculate the inverse square root. This is quite, uh, quite important if you normalize some, some numerical vectors. Well, God only knows uh, why this is uh, so complex when we only want to calculate this formula, right? This is... Uh, well, I won't be going much into the details. First of all, I do not understand uh, it to, to the extent that would allow me to, to uh, like uh, clearly describe it. But the whole idea behind it is to uh, like how the floating point numbers are being represented in the uh, in in C or C plus plus. But basically, basically that works. Uh, the comments here are uh, I'm not sure if you can see it, but the comments here are really interesting. Uh, and that was part of the code that nobody understood. That was probably properly tested, uh, so they could rely on it. But basically, that was much faster than, than the other approaches they tried. So that was the optimization that, that uh, somebody could agree on. But I cannot imagine uh, describing the whole process to, to another developer joining my team. So I would rather stick with the naive approach and just write a simple formula for it. But back in the days, that was the topic. And another example that I really like, this is quite a long story, so I'll just try to shorten it, but uh, in game dev, this is still a topic. Uh, if you create a game for, for Xbox or PlayStation, you are limited to the, to the memory constraints, but that also applies to PCs, right? If you, if you create, a, uh, you cannot uh, expect your, uh, your uh, users to have like uh, 64 gigabytes of RAM for, uh, for a new game because nobody is going to play it. Uh, right, but back in the days, that, there was a story that somebody um, uh, that was the end of the project. Somebody wanted to cut the memory usage for uh, for about 1.5 megabyte because otherwise it won't fit uh, a typical computer use at this time. Uh, so they were trying to do it for quite a long time, and then they came to the to the senior developer of that team who uh, actually knew uh, at the beginning that this is going to happen and make the reservation for some two megabytes somewhere in the code, in the hidden part that nobody was looking at. And within a few seconds, that could be, uh, that could be uh, just uh, uh, removed from the, from the code. And thanks to it, the, the game, was, uh, game was created and was, uh, people were able to, to play it even on the, on the not that uh, distant computer. But there are also some Python specific tricks. Uh, one of them was mentioned during um, one of the yesterday's session, I believe. Uh, it was about reducing the overhead of the data model. That was really great talk and uh, uh, describing the stereotypes. One, uh, the library, the, the author of this library was talking about it and, and I really like the part of reducing the overhead generated by Python classes by providing slots uh, so just limiting the number, uh, the possible uh, uh, parameters of a, of a class instances. So that was really cool. 
and a cool way to, to reduce the memory uh, overhead. Uh, but there are also some uh, some Python specific tricks if you if you are feel really stuck with your task and feel you lost like uh, lost all the belief in the project. If you import this in Python, you will you will get this Zen of Python uh, claiming you that uh, beautiful is better than ugly, etc. So uh, so this is included. If you ever uh, feel stuck, this is just right in your console. And that might be also quite useful if you want to put some placeholder text like lorem ipsum in any place. I use it quite often to, to just put some text in a, in a specific place and I don't need to generate a bunch of text instead. So this is also quite cool for it. Also, if you wanted to uh, serve some static assets, there is a built-in HTTP server that you can run using just a single line command in your console that will start serving the static files from, uh, from the current directory. You can provide the uh, port number, and this is it. You will have the simplest, uh, simplest file server ever. Uh, that won't be, of course, um, using any interpreter, so this is fairly safe. That will be only serving the, uh, your files. Uh, and this is for Python 3. For, in Python 2, that was uh, a different command, but this is also built in. So for some uh, testing purposes, or if you just need to share some files uh, quite quickly, this is, uh, this is good enough. Uh, also, we had another talk about documentation, and there was one question regarding testing the documentation. It turns out that there is a doc test uh, package built in in Python that allows you to test uh, uh, some cases that are described in the in the doc string of the of the specific function. So here you you just call the function in a specific way. This function is intended to just sum uh, sum up the numbers, and if any number uh, if none uh, none of the numbers is provided, then it sums up to zero. So I just put some test. I also expect that if there is any string, I won't be summing it up, even though it's uh, integer at the end of the day. And then I expect some expect. Uh, exception to be thrown, that's also uh, tested here, and just by uh, calling a simple function, I can test all the documentation that I have in my code base. This is thought to be the uh, anti-pattern, but still, if you want to be up to date, up to date I, I don't feel this is a bad idea to just use it right away. Of course, it's not a replacement for all your tests. And dependency injection, that's something that is pretty well known in a JVM world, but I was quite surprised to uh, not see this idea in, in uh, web frameworks of, of Python, but that was introduced in FastAPI, so you can just provide a list of, of the dependencies uh, that your specific endpoint acquires, and uh, they will be automatically, automatically used, so uh, this is fairly uh, easily, easy to be uh, readable, reduce the boilerplate, so really uh, encourage you to use it. But there are also some machine learning tips and tricks that I would like to share. I know that some of you are data scientists, uh, and software, develop software development is quite well established, so we know the good and bad, uh, bad practices, but in machine learning we are still in the early ages, uh, so I would love to share some of those tricks that I was able to find out. Uh, first of all, when we design a neural network or any system, the most boring task ever is to annotate the data. And if you are a single person AI team in your company, then you typically need to do it on your own. And if, if it's about images, then it's pretty fine because uh, you can just listen to a podcast or an audiobook and annotate those examples to, to put into your network. But things are going to be much more complicated if you annotate videos or audio because you need to spend like eight hours uh, listening to some examples and putting the labels on them. So this is fairly, well, this is not the, the, the most interesting part of, of, uh, of any data scientist's work, right? So some lazy minds came to, idea, came to the idea to put the same input and output to the network and do not put any training labels at all. They created autoencoders, and they were quite useful back in the days. They were used to create some first uh, deepfakes. Um, of course, not, not, uh, not exactly like this, but the whole idea in a nutshell is to put the same input, put the same output, and put a specific hidden layer with uh, really low dimensionality, and then force the network to train how to reconstruct given image. So if you are successful in doing that, that would mean that we could like encode possibly 4K image 
into 500, uh, 500 uh, uh, long, uh, uh, 500 long vector. So this is this might be thought as some kind of compression mechanism. Of course, the reconstructed output won't be the same, but if it's really uh, close to the input, then that means that it was uh, quite uh, uh, quite well compressed, and we are able to to put uh, really complex data into much lower dimensionality. So this is this is uh, perfectly fine, and that's also a base for something that is uh, quite common nowadays: some pre-trained models. So um, in the past, when you were working on some uh, on some uh, machine learning project, you had to implement your whole network from the scratch. So you started with some random weights and uh, started the training process that could take weeks, months. Well, that, that was cool, right? Because we could spend those, that time watching some YouTube videos or talking to our colleagues uh, while sipping another cup of coffee in the in the of, uh, office kitchen. But since, I don't know, a few years at least, uh, it turned out that those simple models that we are able to train on our own are not capable of solving those complex tasks, tasks that we need to solve nowadays. So it started a completely new world, in the new world of pre-trained models, which are available out of the box. So you can go to a website like Hugging Face, take the network that was already trained on a different vision problem, Append, append some new layers on top of that network, train them, and then uh, retrain, uh, let's say, network that was trained on some uh, flower images to work with, I don't know, uh, cars, whatever you want to. But this is called fine tuning. Uh, but in practice, uh, those pre-trained models are, have like millions of parameters, million of, millions of weights, and we are not able, and we not necessarily want to change all those weights during the training process. Uh, as you may see, we attached uh, so-called head, so some new layers, layers that we added on our own. So we only want to train those layers. And um, the idea that is quite commonly used is to freeze this uh, neural encoder, this original pre-trained model, and just fine tune those, uh, those weights in the new, uh, newly attached head. And this is quite cool because the training takes uh, less time. And uh, instead of uh, optimizing, I don't know, millions of weights, we can optimize thousands. That, that saves a lot of time and money because those, uh, those deep models take, I don't know, thousands or even millions of dollars to, to be trained properly. So we just save, uh, save a lot of time and money by, by uh, um, changing the weights in the, in the newly created part of the network. And that is quite strange, because if you just look at any tutorial of Python, Python Lightning, Python or TensorFlow, whatever, you will be encouraged to load your images from the disk, put through this neural encoder, and then train the network back without changing the weights here. But this is a huge I.O. overhead, because you still need to load those images, even though this part of the network is deterministic. For some reason, they do not care about I/O load, uh, and I was quite surprised because I, I didn't I, I didn't care before. But when I joined Quadrant, uh, they told me that we are working on a on a similarity learning framework, and well, that's cool. But why do we need another framework for uh, for similarity learning? At the end of the day, it's a part of uh, neural networks, and we could optimize them using PyTorch or whatever we use. But it turned out that nobody has ever thought about including the, a cache mechanism that will save you a lot of time because you won't, be, uh, you won't need to load those images, but they will be just loaded once, stored on your GPU, CPU, uh, whenever, uh, whatever uh, device you use to, to train your network, and that will speed up your, uh, your training process by you know, 100 times. So, uh, this is quite quite interesting that nobody uh, nobody else came to the same conclusion. So if you work with with similarity learning, then that will save save you a lot of time because this cache mechanism is quite cool and can be configured within a few lines of code. Um, okay, it's time for some final uh, final thoughts. Uh, first of all, 
in order to prepare those examples, I asked the question on Hacker News that was, uh, that even came to the first page, was upvoted quite well. So if you are interested in those stories, then you can just uh, go there and see the responses. Some of the ideas were, were really crazy. Uh, but there are also some cool ideas, like re replacing arrays of structures with structures of arrays. This is like a different paradigm, like comparing row-based uh, uh, databases to column-oriented ones. So it's like a different paradigm. If you want to operate on a specific column, then it's probably a better idea to keep them close in the, in the memory so you could, I don't know, calculate some statistic out of them. Um, but the best and worst idea uh, was this one, that you could harden a Linux server by killing the init process. So uh, that would cause a kernel panic and prevent new processes uh, running. Uh, but the existing processing, like web servers, will be still running. So you can put it at the end of your boot script, and nobody will be ever even able to SSH to the, to the specific server. So that will be self as hell. Uh, I haven't tried it. Honestly, I'm not sure if that works in all the distros, but, but, but some people uh, just uh, responded to that, that that works, that can be used. That's the worst idea ever. But if you, if you are on a budget and need to save some, uh, save some money on the safety, this is an interesting procedure. <laughs> However, in reality, the, the most common response to my question was the, the most clever trick is not to use any tricks at all. Because nowadays, we don't really need to uh, care that much about the memory and CPU usage because the uh, language uh, compilers and interpreters are capable of helping us out of the box. And uh, the most clever thing to do is to write a code that is readable for, for the others. Um, and this is something that I will really encourage you to do. However, there are some interesting stories. And if you have any, I will be happy to, to listen. listen to them. Please just feel free to, to, to reach me anytime. And this is time for questions, I think. Uh, yes. So, uh, where is the line between healthy assumptions, breaking and overthinking, uh, tailoring to the single person who doesn't have at least uh, name seems like overthinking? Well, I, I wouldn't agree it's overthinking. Actually, if we know that we are operating on a specific market, then of course there are some assumptions, but, but we are typically reinventing the wheel, right? It's, this, pro this kind of problems are already solved. So, so just trying to find a proper, uh, proper solution to the, to the given problem is quite, uh, quite easy nowadays. There are probably a lot of blog posts, at least in this case, in case of, of uh, people's names. But if you are a developer, then asking some good questions is, is always uh, the best idea. There is probably somebody that understands the, the process behind the, the software that you create, the part of the world that you're trying to model a bit better than you. So I would say that that's, that's the, the, uh, the best idea, the, 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 the biggest power that we have is asking the right questions and making some assumptions on our own beliefs or our thoughts uh, may just lead us to serious issues. If we do not understand the given problem, then we will typically fail. I, would, I wouldn't say it's overthinking, but because, well, let's say if we, if we are thinking about it, about not asking others about the, the, the answer, than it, than it is, but, but we have some people that tell us what to do typically. So asking them those questions is, is the best way to, to uh, like reduce the risk of overthinking and that's what I would suggest to do. All right, so the second question is, does caching mean that I cannot use uh, data augmentation? Not really, you can actually can do it, but your, well, if you mean like dynamic data augmentation, then probably that will fail uh, uh, because uh, if you just create some different examples of an, uh, at any, uh, any uh, epoch, then probably that may be a trouble for, for the cache mechanism. However, if you just augment your data at the very beginning and like uh, make your data set a bit bigger with those new examples, then it will work pretty fine because it, it will be also uh, uh, sent through this neural encoder once put into the cache, and then uh, all, the, all the rest of the training will be done 
just just in those missing layers that you added to the network. So this is also also uh, possible to be used with the data augmentation. Um, well, depending on how you how you how you uh, how you implement it, but not necessarily that's not necessarily an issue. Okay, uh, thank you, Katsper. That's it. Thank you very much. Mikrobit je programovateľný mini počítač, ktorý ti dovolí prepojiť informatiku s kreativitou. Dá sa programovať veľmi jednoducho a ovládať tak, aby robil presne to, čo chceš. O pár minút sme zvládli rozsvietiť vlastný obrázok na displeji a o chvíľu sme už obrázky diálkovo prepínali druhým mikrobitom. Mikrobit má v sebe aj super vychytávky, ako sú tlačidlá, senzor pohybu, kompas a teplomer. K mikrobitu ale môžeš pripojiť množstvo ďalších vecí. Tu programujeme, aká animácia sa nám má ukázať na LED pásiku. Ja som na ňom naprogramovala dúhu. Teraz programujeme podľa nôd kohútika Jarabého. Najlepšie na mikrobite je, že si viem vytvoriť napríklad blikajúceho robota alebo gitaru, ktorú ovládať tak, že ňou zatraciem, alebo futbalovú bránku, kde mi mikrobit počíta, koľko gólov som dala, alebo kúlové svietiace topánky a tisíc ďalších vecí, ktoré ešte len vymyslím. Mikrobit je hračka, ktorú schováš do dlane a vytvoríš z nej čokoľvek. Tak čo s ňou spravíš ty? Každých 60 sekúnd si 28 tisíc ľudí predplatí službu Netflix. Odošle sa 197 miliónov e-mailov, stiahne sa 414 tisíc aplikácií a ukradne niekoľko tisíc hesiel. Na internete sa toho deje veľa. A všetko najdôležitejšie sa dozviete na Živé SK. Živé SK. Technológie ľudskou rečou.